We had a sudden change of speaker this morning and I'm very excited to uh, tell you that the theme is still around sustainability and um, I'll introduce our speaker shortly. So we're going to start off with a little bit of an update from myself and then we're going to have a quick pitch from the Ministry of Social Development and they've got some really interesting services for, for businesses at the moment and they're going to uh, let you know about that. And then we have Rollo Wenlock from Miro Rail who's going to tell us his vision for um, sustainable transport in Canterbury which is rather exciting. And then we'll um, open the floor for some questions and then have a bit of uh, network and some more drinks and food and um, then we'll head on home. So first of all, thanks to our amazing tech sponsors. Uh, we've got the UC School of Business um, that brings us the most relevant MBA program and executive education program in the country. Um, we've got AWS, they're known for their infrastructure services, but they really are ready to assist businesses with knowledge in so many areas. So if you're exploring something new, they're a really great team to reach out to. And we've been working with AWS to get the AWS Restart program back to Christchurch, which is about infrastructure training. Um, Lumen PDF have such a cool team. New office just at the other end of um, Raora Park, and they've just offered a fantastic discount on their PDF editing software for all of our members. So we'll get that out to everyone soon. So if you're um, uh, the admin for your membership, then we'll send those um, those codes out shortly. We've also got two new sponsors that have joined us. Very exciting, Stratos Technology Partners. Obviously, their CEO David Carter's been a long-term supporter and committee member of Canterbury Tech and um, so we're really happy to have your support and Integration Works who just um, arrived in Christchurch and are busy expanding their team and um, they're really niche they just do integrations and they do it so well that Canterbury Tech thought we're going to use you guys to help our system integration so I've just um, finished a new systems upgrade and now they're helping us out with our systems integration it's going really swimmingly so um, check out teams from there today uh, us people here today um, Thank you so much to WebTools who often supports us and we have um, quite a lot of our events up here. Um, so thanks very much to WebTools. We're trying to expand the number of benefits that, our, um, that are exclusive benefits just to our members. And so the UC School of Business is offer, offering a 10% discount on all short courses from the Executive Education Program. Um, and so you can, if you want to take um, uh, if you want to get in on that, then you need to write to ex exec ed at canterbury.ac.nz. It auto corrects to exceed, so just be careful of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't book it through the uh, main website. You um, email them directly if you want to take um, advantage of that 10% discount. And Concentrate, uh, Patrick here tonight from Concentrate, a digital marketing company. They've also elite partners with HubSpot um, and they're offering to do a digital marketing benchmark report. So if you want to work out where your business is at at the moment, they'll um, do a really nice scan for you and, um, and let you know some actionable insights. So book in your uh, meeting with them if you want to check out where you are in the market. It's not long now. Who's, who's got their tickets? Who hasn't got their tickets? Oh, you're gonna miss out if you don't get in soon. These, um, there's only a few tickets left and I'm really serious, so do book in now because people will be disappointed very soon. Um, we are looking at max, over max capacity, um, so that's gonna be a fun time. We've got two different zones and we've also got a marquee, so if you wanna listen to the speakers, you can, but if you just wanna come and network and chat and meet people, there's a whole like um, marquee zone for um, just uh, getting social that day. So I wanted to let you know about a couple of special projects that Canterbury Techs are doing. This is one that um, Neil Hamilton kicked off with uh, the Dorinda Britain team and it's really trying to answer um, some parts of the skills shortage that we have in New Zealand and looking to capture untapped talent. So we know that one in ten people in New Zealand are dyslexic and tech industry is a fantastic 
place for uh, dyslexic people to thrive because um, they uh, are able to um, articulate and uh, with charismatic leadership and uh, they are very great at um, people and social skills and out-of-the-box thinking. And so we're running this uh, pilot program. We're in the end of stage one now. Uh, we've been co-designing a new blueprint for um, supporting dyslexic people into technology and we've been partnered with Indie Technology, Trimble and Focus Software and we've been sponsored by Vodafone and with funding from um, MB and that's just going so well. I'm really excited to be able to share more stories about that in our newsletter um, over time. Uh, stage two will kick off next year when we're actually going to be piloting the blueprint which we've designed and bringing more dyslexic people um, into the technology sector. This is the amazing team, Dorinda in the middle and the research team there. We've also been um, working with Christchurch NZ to get more women into technology and Web Tools actually hosted the first session. It was so successful. I've had so much contact from the women that, um, that uh, attended there and they're running another one here on the 26th of October. So thanks again for Web Tools' support for that. Um, what we heard a lot of was that women got into tech because men who were in tech suggested that they did. It's quite an interesting one. So if you, there's a woman in your life that you think needs a change in career and you think they've got the skills um, <clears throat> to, to do something in tech, bring them along, yeah? If you're an employer looking for awesome women who want to work in tech, come along and you'll be able to cherry pick some amazing people. They were like doctors of social science and civil engineers and really talented women that want to be working in technology businesses. So I really encourage you to, to come along to that. We also got our ecosystem map. If you are a small dot on our ecosystem map, it means you haven't filled out the form. Please fill out the form because when we get to the um, tech summit, we want to have an amazing um, interactive screen where you can click on your bubble and show off who you are. So um, go onto our website or you can Google ecosystem map Canterbury Tech and find, you'll find the form to fill in at the bottom. Or in our late, latest newsletter, there's also links to that. And um, our ecosystem map is brought to you by Orbviz, which is this amazing tool um, brought to you just across the road, um, the Orbica and Orbviz team creating this amazing um, data visualization platform for making reports really fun to, to play with. Welcome to our newest members. Anyone here on the list? I've talked to a few new people there. Ben, welcome. Well, we've had some a uh, bit of a flurry of, of uh, companies joining as well, which has been great. Make yourself known if you're new and shy. Um, and now I wanted to introduce you to the Ministry of Social Development, James and Denise. There's a, click. <laughs> There's a clicker there. <clears throat> you can stand in the front there if you like. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll sit out of your way. There we go. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, my name's Denise Wiggins, I actually work for connected.gov.nz and you may go, oh my goodness, what is that? Um, it was a response by government to COVID when it uh, set in in 2020, two years ago, um, and initially they set up a website and a contact centre, etc., as well as 35 sites throughout New Zealand. Um, one of our biggest partners obviously is Ministry of Social Development, where there's a lot of job seekers looking for work. So we've had a big focus on um, job seekers, but just down here, you'll see there's also a focus on businesses, which is why we've come along tonight to talk to you about it. Um, so James from MSD is going to talk to you in regards to the support that uh, MSD provides, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. Can you over? 
Um, so support for businesses, just to give you an idea, um, MB, as you know, is one of those key government agencies. Within them, they've got Employment um, NZ that provides training as well as advice in employment practices and the latest uh, release in terms of practices, etc. So online training for you. Um, if there are any changes in legislation, etc., it's the first point of call. Um, but they can also run some programs there. Um, Business.gov.nz, uh, again, if anybody's looking at setting up their own business, it's got all of the tools that you need in terms of a business plan, thinking about marketing, etc. Um, and also NZTE oversee the investor and exporting side of things. And also if you have um, Māori or Pacifica staff, Tepuna Kōkiri and Ministry of um, Pacific Peoples also have some funding available. So if you're interested, have a look at our um, connected.gov.nz website um, and you'll find um, support for businesses up there and you can have a bit of a look around. Um, and I'll also leave my details um, here with the team so if you want to have a chat with us we do a lot of events we work closely with um, Christchurch NZ and other agencies uh, we do lots of things to facilitate basically job seekers meeting with employers um, and they've been really successful we've had quite a number of skilled migrants coming along to events um, and also graduates etc as well so um, some of that connecting stuff it's all in the name um, is what we're all about and um, Having worked in IT as well as IT and engineering recruitment, I'm really passionate about raising awareness for you guys so that you know what's available. Okay, pass you over to James. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um, so, who am I? I'm James. Uh, I am a work broker for the Ministry of Social Development. I represent the employment sector of the Ministry of Social Development because they're a pretty big group and they do a lot of things. Um, what I can really say is, uh, for the last four years, I've been helping job seekers find their way into employment. And I've kind of uh, shifted in my role, and I'm going to show that on the next slide about what I'm actually here to talk to you about tonight. But I want to give you a general overview about what MSD offers overall, and then I'll get into what I actually specialize in. <laughs> so, um, Job Connect. Job Connect is a, uh, how can I put it there, it's sort of like a remote service that helps job seekers connect to vacancies we've got listed with us. So kind of like a recruitment uh, agency, if you've got a job vacancy, you can list it with MSD and MSD can drag from the pool of all job seekers nationwide and actually send you appropriate candidates to relative to your business, relative to your needs. So so long as you just connect with us <laughs> and then tell our job connect team what uh, sort of, you know, job seeker you want, then we can actually look from all job seekers nationwide. And that doesn't necessarily include people who are on a benefit or on uh, any type of welfare. As far as we're concerned, we serve all of Aotearoa. So anyone who is job seeking, we're there to help them out. Of course you deserve. Right? Uh, training incentives and wage subsidies. Local work broker, I'm a local work broker. Kind of like a recruitment agent, um, I represent about 35 of us. We're all uh, darted throughout the different service centres and we, um, we love to connect with our local uh, employers. So come check us out. But the training uh, wage subsidies, so there is a really basic wage subsidy called flexi wage, which is what a work broker would broker with an employer to offset the cost of taking on a new trainee. So we understand that there's going to be like a learning curve where a person may not be as very productive in the beginning. And so we want to offset that cost by subsidising their employment if you want to come and have a chat to us about that. But that brings me to this, what I do. I don't encourage you to look at that wall of text, don't worry about it, <laughs> because I want you to come talk to me afterwards. And I'll tell you what it is. Um, Maramahi. Maramahi stands for strength and work. This is the product I specialise in. I've been doing this since 2020. Essentially, it is a, a large wage subsidy, which we pay to employers to offset them taking them through a formal qualification, right? Interestingly, here in Canterbury, our lead industry is tech. It's actually IT and tech when it comes to wage subsidies to help people into um, qualifications. So you might think, oh, you know, maybe it'd be like construction, or maybe it'd be agriculture or something like that. No, it's actually computer tech. We couldn't be prouder, because we know that's a very difficult field to get into, particularly if someone hasn't got a qualification to begin with, right? So I suppose what I would encourage you to do today is speak to me afterwards around how that kind of looks. But I honestly, there are legitimate training pathways that can help a job seeker go from kind of zero to hero, and we can use a substantial way subsidy to offset that cost. So for employers, that looks about $16,000 over one year, so in the first 12 months, as well as $3,000 paid directly to our trainees as incentives to keep them engaged in their employment and engaged in their training pathways. Um, so please do come have a chat to me afterwards. I've got collateral with me. 
I've also got my business cards and any information you might want. So I'd like to share that with you if you're remotely interested. And if you're not interested, share it with your network. Grab my email. <laughs> community. So, yeah. Great, great. Thank you, James and Denise. Thank you very much. That's an offer you can't refuse, isn't it? For people that are struggling to get staff, it's definitely go and have a chat to these guys afterwards. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rolo Wenlock. I'm very excited to introduce you to him because he's been so gracious at the last minute, stepping in when we realised that our last speaker needed to be on a plane taking care of other business tonight. So um, Rolo and Miro Rail have arrived in Christchurch with a bang and I'm very excited for him to tell us the story of his future vision for Canterbury. And so I will hand over to you now. Give him a warm round of applause. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Rolo. Hello everyone. Jesus, it's bright in here. You can stand over there. Oh no, I don't want to hide. Is there any way to turn some of these light lights down? It feels like we're in some sort of... <laughs> you can just turn them all off and then it's all calm and everyone can just <laughs> listen to the story and fall asleep. Oh, that's, yeah, actually just the ones at the back on would be... No, this, this is great. <laughs> the, yeah, great. Good job. Hello, everyone. My name is Rollo Wenlock, and I am from Canterbury. And I moved here when I was five from England, and my dad, who is from Derby, his dad's dad built trains in the north of England. And on my mum's side, she's half English and half Kiwi, her mum's dad ran the railway just above Dunedin. So in my lineage, I've got people who run railways and make the trains. So I thought I should just put those two things together. <laughs> just for the hell of it. I personally have no experience in trains other than my dad, who's a bit of a nutter, he sends me emails with recordings of steam trains going past that he's recorded as an MP3 off a record <laughs> and says, what train is this? And I say, no idea. <laughs> and I don't care. Stop emailing me. Who are you? <laughs> so there's trains in the blood, right? So in the last 10 years, what I've been doing is I, uh, I started a, a software company. Um, and before that, I didn't have any tech experience. I was just interested in products. It's called Whipster. Somebody may have heard of it. And it's a video review app. And, and it's not really important what it is. It's that it, it turned into a, an international company and has employees and revenue and customers like Disney and Microsoft and things like that. And it kind of worked. And I, you know, 80% of every, everything I was doing as the founder and the CEO didn't work, but 20% did and, and we got there. So I thought, all right, well, I've learned a lot by doing something for 10 years. Let's make it 10 times harder and do some hardware Let's, let's make something physical, because software is actually really easy. It's not, but you know. <clears throat> if you want to link with me, get your phone out. This is all super high tech. Get your phone out, and that will take you to my LinkedIn. It's good to connect on there, because then you can either keep up with what's going on with what we're doing with Mineral Rail, which I'm about to tell you about, um, or you might be interested in joining in the team, or you might be an investor, or you might just be interested. So I'll also have this at the end. So if you don't quite get it now, because I'm just about to click three, two, one, and it's gone. <laughs> so what is Mero Rail? It is a hardware technology company. And it's, a, it, it's essentially an IP company where we design high speed battery electric rail cars for narrow gauge railways. And what that is, is that across the world, there are different gauges of rail, which is how far are the rails apart. Bullet trains are about there. Narrow gauge is about there. Bullet trains go this fast. Narrow gauge trains go this fast. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way, because you see that I wrote high speed and narrow gauge. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. So, <laughs> So the other piece of it is rail cars. And what a rail car is, is a self-powered carriage. 
So you don't have a disgusting big diesel locomotive out the front with all these carriages just getting dragged around. You just have a carriage and it drags itself around. And it's battery electric, which means you don't need to worry about any sort of emissions and you don't need to worry about quaternary, which is the wires that go above, which is a terrible piece of technology in my view. And you just have to deal with things like fast charging at stations and whatnot and so forth. But let me get into it. So the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because <clears throat> that thing on the left is a mess. It's huge, heavy, dirty, and slow. This thing for New Zealand is also a mess because it's huge, heavy, really fast, and in insanely expensive. 100 million US dollars per kilometer to put down track for this pain in the neck. So. No, not you and not, not you. And so that's why we came up with something different, which is if you've got scattered demand, which is a term we've come up with, TM, scattered demand, <laughs> which is people all over the place, not that many of them, because there's only five million of us, but a landmass the size of Japan, you've got scattered demand. What do you do? Do you get one of these messes and put nine carriages on it and do one journey a week? No. Do you get one of these? No, you don't, because that costs $20 billion to go from here to Picton. So see you later, mate. <laughs> what you do, though, is that you have a very small unit. It goes very quickly. We're thinking 200 kilometers an hour on the current rails. It's very light, and it means that we can go all the time. So it's a little bit like a, a distributed model, all these little things buzzing around. Bzzz. And they can also go in series. So if you go, oh, there's a huge demand, lots of people want to go on the train. You just have them so that they're close to each other, but we don't waste time by building all the coupling and all that crap. They just go close to each other and then they go in series. And then when they can't be bothered doing that anymore, they just go off and go to their little locations where eight people want to go that way, 62 want to go that way, and off they go. So in New Zealand, we've got 3,500 K of track narrow gauge, and that's a lot for a small for a small population it's not a lot for the size of the land though i think we keep forgetting how goddamn big new zealand is it's as long as america it's, it's actually slightly longer than america it's just really thin that's the only thing so you know it's very very slim very slim but then you look at look at the world and it's got 127,000 kilometers of the same narrow gauge this is not bullet trains Japan has more narrow gauge than it does bullet trains. Interesting. And who's innovating for that? No one other than us, of course. Because there's an interesting thing about New Zealand companies, and you will have seen it, I think somebody was talking about Fisher and Paykel at some point, where they made some weird little device for, does anybody remember what the device is for? It's a really weird health thing. Because there's Fisher and Paykel health, and then there's fridges and all that other stuff. So they were like, oh, we're going to fix this really weird little problem that looks like a small market for an international company, and now billions of dollars. So we go, this annoying little gauge that no one cares about, we'll solve that better than any other train has ever solved anything, and then we'll sell it to 127,000 kilometers of other people. But part of what I want to talk about is not that it is going to be the safest, fastest, greenest train in the whole world, but how we're going to do it, and why we're making certain decisions. So here, and this is why I thought we should make it dark, <laughs> here the story begins. 1784, kind of when trains came around, because we had things like the weaving loom. No, because we had things like steam power, right? And, and so we're able to make machines that, that can drag lots of people and go somewhere and it works very well with large populations, not so well with small ones. Um, as you move on, you've got mass production, automation, networks, Internet of Things, all sor sorts of things. But what I think has been missing, has this got a laser? What I think has been missing is how we think about industry. Because industry is, is um, and I think my next slide answers it, is filled with the arrogance of humanity. And <laughs> I'm glad you like that. 
And what I mean by the arrogance of humanity is that we just, humans, just do whatever the fuck we want, don't we? There's a pig in the way, we'll just kick the fucking pig out of the way. We don't care. We want to eat more pigs, we'll just grow heaps of pigs. Just the way we want, and then we'll fucking stab them and eat them, right? Arrogance of humanity, we just do whatever. Build anything out of anything, don't care, you know? Kill all the fish in the river, whatever. Doesn't matter, we just want milk. So the arrogance of humanity is not being dealt with in the way that industry is looking at itself. So I say, forget Industry 4. I mean, this stuff's OK, but it's pretty boring. Industry 5, working with nature separately, life cycle, separately, the sun. So what I mean by that, <coughs> imagine you're going to make something and you do the classic arrogant human thing. And you don't think about any of, the, any of the network around what you're doing. You just think about what you're doing, what you can get off someone else, and then what the outcome is going to be without any care about the fish. So the next few slides, I'm going to explain what I mean by Industry 5. Now this is interesting because you may not guess it, but the train under the veil, which I'm going to show you some of, but not much, is going to be made out of this stuff. And so can you imagine that you'll be going at 200 kilometers an hour through the New Zealand countryside, killing not one pig <laughs> on a train made of bamboo? How can you guarantee that you won't take out a pig train? <laughs> because of the internet of things, you see. <laughs> <laughs> Harakiki, amazing, amazing product. Wool, hemp, and many more. Lots of composites that we're playing with as well. And the really interesting thing about these is that you will know that already New Zealand is very good at growing a lot of this, um, even that one. But we don't do a lot of bamboo. Fastest growing, highest tensile strength product in the world. And we can, we have the climate for it, but we just chose not to for some reason. So. When I look at the industry of the future and I look about how the humans are going to integrate more into the way the world actually works, not just be arrogant and kick everything out of the way, we look at permaculture. So this is, somebody lives in a nice house, they've got some fruit and vegetable, some animals, all sorts of things, honeybees over there, how nice, right? And a lot of this stuff is, is built in a way that it, it thrives off its, off its own cyclic, cyclic nature. That some of these plants allow the other plants to live a better life and so on and so forth, and the insects. <clears throat> and so what you have is a human, or a bunch of humans, trying to integrate more into how the world works. It's still a little bit arrogant because look, we've just put everything in lines. And we're like, oh, we'll put these here, but then you have to be over there, not over here. And then we'll, we'll put a fence so you can't go over there. And on it goes. So it's got a little bit, I find it a little too, too much. But when we think about this, can you imagine a manufacturing facility making $10 billion worth of trains in that environment? So it looks like that. So there is the manufacturing facility just where you saw that little house. And you're growing all the materials that you're building with in the facility. So you, you just wander outside, get some bamboo, bring it back in, and you're away. So you don't have to import bamboo. You don't have to figure out some sort of order. You're just simply growing the train just outside and then building it just inside. And it will look pretty much like that. So this is what the train that we're building is starting to look like. This is wood. That is LVL, bamboo LVL. So it's stronger than steel in every possible way for the weight. And it has the right dynamics of, of twist that a train needs, better than steel. I don't know why no one else is doing this. <laughs> Why would you build it out of steel when steel doesn't even have the right twist? So you've got that, 
um, and that is a 20 meter LVL. This is interesting, this is a single unit, a single pressed unit made out of hemp. And the, you see these holes and these LVLs, they just slide on. So when somebody says we want a train and, and we want it to do a little bit of work around the centre of Auckland and we need people to be able to stand up and put their bikes on top of it. You just get the ones that allow that to happen. And press them out, put them all on the LVLs, battery pack slides underneath and you're away. And then when one of them breaks, you just slide it off and slide a new one on. And when it comes to the end of life per piece, you just take it back to your studio, let's, let's call it a studio, the train studio, and you just grind it down. And then that, that's it. There's no steel that then suddenly has to be melted again with huge amounts of energy. So would you rather work here, and this picture was taken this year, how exciting is that? <laughs> Trains being made in the world. How cool is that? Would you like to work there, or would you prefer to work in there? Because that's where we're working. So the second part is beyond materials. So the materials is very, very important because I think that, that the, whole, the whole way humans interact with materials is going to change dramatically or we're all just going to die. So when we think about battery electric, we are betting on a battery electric future. And we're betting that everything to do with battery electric is going to get better and better and better and better to the point that you'll run your entire house off a battery no bigger than that. Fairly soon, you know, decades. So the way we view it, <coughs> capture the energy from the sun, store the energy, use the energy. Preferably all in one go, so that the unit that moves is capturing its own energy from the sun. And we won't get there at the beginning because photovoltaic uh, is not that advanced, but it will get there. And so as we look at, say, the last decade, the last 15 years, the PV panels are getting more and more efficient per square centimetre. The batteries are becoming cheaper and cheaper per kilowatt or megawatt. And this is an interesting thing. This is one of the potential suppliers um, that is working on a 118 kilowatt motor that we may or may not use. Probably won't, actually. Um, but look at it. <coughs> this is the previous one. Look at that. 94% size reduction, 86% less weight, 100 kilograms versus 695 kilograms, and it produces the exact same amount of output, of motive power. This is what we're up to. This is kind of where the arrogance of humanity kind of doesn't matter for a little while, is that we're actually pretty good at making cool stuff. So imagine that getting smaller and, and stronger, that getting smaller and greener and stronger, and that becoming more and more effective per square centimetre, and then you have a train with panels on its roof and you never plug it in, and cars and houses and everything. And it means that we snap the cord of charging and power and all this wiring and all this stuff that no one really wants, it's all gone because it will all just be battery electric everything. Every single light will have its own way of getting power. So then it brings me right round to the idea of, well, what is sustainable in a business, uh, specifically trains, because that's what I'm doing, but what makes it sustainable ongoing? We talked about materials, pretty cool. We talked about energy and motive, kind of cool. But what about the people? So here is a five-year-old girl called Clara, who's at the school disco. That's my kid. So the people, if you get the people wrong, then none of the other stuff will go anywhere because the people won't understand their place. They won't have inherent value, and they won't know what their purpose is. And I mean the people who work in these environments. And so it's, it's very important that if you want to do all of those other cool things, you have to be very clear on what the mission is for these people. You have to align their passion for what they like doing in their lives with what you're trying to achieve. 
so that they gain pleasure by what they're doing. Because I believe quite heavily that people are 100% motivated by pleasure. And I don't just mean the pleasure you're thinking of. I mean the pleasure of anything. Eating a hamburger, you know, going for a walk, watching a sunset, patting a dog, anything. We're, we're motivated by the pleasure of doing things and we get up in the morning because we have a passion for something. And so I believe that a company has to be very, very focused on these three things with its people. Otherwise, all the cool stuff that I'm talking about doesn't happen because I eventually die. My daughter eventually dies. You're all going to die really soon. No, <laughs> you're all going to die. And then what do the next people do? What did they learn? What did they think of what the mission was? So when you put it all together, you then have a group of humans that are in harmony with the world a lot more than we are today. And I think that is what sustainable means. Thank you. Should we have the lights on for questions? Thanks so much, Rollo. Well, very inspiring story and vision for the future. We have a question. Where are you out at in the journey so far? We are working on the prototype. So the, the prototype is a, Jesus Christ, <laughs> is, a, <laughs> is, a, is a $25 million endeavor, uh, and it'll be completed, I'm going to say, in two years. <laughs> there you go, in two years. <laughs> Commitment, yeah. Yeah, it may or may not be completed in two years. Question over here. I can't decide whether you're a visionary or whether I want to smoke whatever you're smoking. <laughs> Because trains have already gone 245 kilometers an hour on three foot six gauge. Where? South Africa. What? What, what train? What speed did you say? 245. A passenger train? Yes. And commercial service? No. <laughs> what, what end did 245 kilometers an hour on three foot six gauge? A locomotive pulling a carriage. Okay. So New Zealand I read your article on stuff um, sure. a week ago. Good article. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, the New Zealand from here to the mm. if you did 200 kilometres an hour, you would physically leave the track and levitate because we go up and down with South Africa, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And the travel times that you were claiming and the stopping distances, mm -hmm. I, it seems, it seems, um, and a rail car is going to carry how many people? Between 50 and 120, depending on what configuration it's built in. Okay. Okay, because the energy consumption at those speeds is massive. It is. So it would be as much as a car? No, it wouldn't be as much as a car per person per kilometre. Why? Because you're, you've got the, um, if you think about all the different cars, so if you go 50 cars and you, and you look at the front of each of all those cars, yes. put all those areas together, yep. and then try and move through space. I'm the drag. Sport, the drag is the sum of the square. You're doing mm. 200 kilometers an hour, or 300, I think I read in one of those. Yeah, in testing, we'll go up to 300, because we want to break the world record, but that's, that's just <laughs> for fun. The drag is the sum of the square, so yeah. when I sort of thought about it, you'd be using as much energy per person as a car, and you'd be claiming 95% energy reduction if it didn't sort of sit. 90, 94% uh, emissions reduction. Which is energy? Well, it's, it's emissions, which is a different way of looking at it. You, you can look so at you energy. In the, these massive batteries you're going to have to have, are you factoring in the whole life cycle of replacing the batteries and things? Um, we're not going to have massive batteries. We're, we're, we're going to have fast charging at stations along the way. But still massive batteries. What does this train, this 100 person train weigh? Hopefully, under 10 tons. So, if it hit a chicken, it would explode. <laughs> <laughs> would, it, would anyone else like to answer these questions? No, no, I okay. think right. Like, I really hope you're right. Like, Elon Musk is equally mad. You know, but, uh, but he's heading to Mars. Yeah, everything he says 
is mad, and yet somehow it proves that he's right. He's like, still right. He's pardon? He's mad. Yeah, he's right all the time. Like, if he sees he's going to do it, like cyber traps, I'm like, there's no, to use your word, effing way, and yet he's got a track record of madness and being right. Someone's got sure. to have the vision to push through. Yeah, yeah, I, ho right. I hope you're right. Yeah. I'm just sort of asking the questions. Yeah. Ten tons with 100 people on it. What does a 50 person coach that weighs, that does 100 kilometers an hour weigh? 20 tons. Uh, Coach? You, you mean a bus or a... Bus, yeah, 20 tons. I don't know how much bus weighs. 20 tons. 20 tons. Mm. There you go. Yeah, so I, I got to say 20 tons. So, this bamboo stuff, it better be good. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Born over here? Um, so, you're obviously building the, the train itself. Are you also starting to think about the, the wider infrastructure of how you coordinate the, you know, the trains mm. to move around the track and things like that? Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a network of different operators. Um, so Kiwi Rail runs the rail, um, and, and so their job is to make sure that the, the, there is a rail. And then there is a, a train service provider, like a trans dev or someone, who then puts the service on with the rolling stock. And then there is our customer, which is the council, that then pays for that to happen. And then there is the rolling stock provider, which so far has usually been overseas because that's where they're made. And then we would be that provider. Um, and so when we look at stations and platform heights and all of those things, there is a bit of change in some areas that have to be done. Sometimes it's that there is no station anymore. Like they've pulled it down, <laughs> you know, because a lot of the places that we're going to go haven't had passenger trains for a long time. So it will have to, it will have to be built up again. Um, and then there's a range of other elements around crossings. There's rail crossings, signaling. Um, there's a few updates that have to be done there, and some of them will have to change. And so the, to the point of going 200k and levitating to Dunedin, um, it's, it's about going the right speed for the right piece of track. And so every piece of track where there is a rail crossing, there is a speed limit, which is much lower than 200 kilometers an hour. And so you have to slow down for that at this point in time. And over time, they'll be lobbying to raise those speeds as they get built to withstand, you know, cars stopping. Because currently, <clears throat> I don't know yet. No, not not compared to a loco pulling all the all the other stuff. Because that's a thousand tons, so it'll be fairly short. Regenerative braking as well. So when you brake. Charge up the battery. Would the expectation be the customers need to be wearing a seatbelt? Well, there is an interesting thing because when you look at the ATR 72, that small aeroplane that goes here to Wellington, that is a similar size to what we're doing, and you have to be strapped in to, to fly. And it's an interesting thing to go is there a possibility for behavior change that people would think of strapping themselves in, in a train? Maybe. If it looked like a spaceship, maybe they'd be keen on it, but probably not. If you traveled in a Tesla, you'd want to have that seatbelt on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Buses have seatbelts. Buses do, yeah. Yeah, that's true. So um, we're raising the, uh, the first five million at the moment. And it's and that's coming along. VCs? Yep. VCs, high net worths. Yeah, 100% Kiwi. We, we want to do this whole thing Kiwi. Um, we've talked with uh, somebody who's connected to Punakaiki. Do you know, do you know Jez? Right. So Jez is currently doing the numbers, as he calls it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I've got two questions. First, what about the wheels? Yeah. You didn't say anything about... You know, are they metal? Are they? No, they're not metal. Are they bamboo? What, what are the wheels? We don't know. We don't know yet which which um, process is going to win out. But it's going to be like a lot of the stuff that we're designing is for it to fail on purpose um, in much shorter increments than normal. So things fail in trains over a 50-year period, or a five-year period, or a 10-year period, and we're looking at things that fail in a three-month period so that they're really easy to swap out. So if you think of some sort of composite wheel, okay. looking at how does that deal with traction, you know, is it actually going to grip? And then also in the reverse, how does it deal with braking? 
and then also does it just simply break? <laughs> so we don't know the answer yet. Many materials. What's that? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, like exploding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll do that in testing. We won't put people on it. <laughs> that leads to my second question: Is what what's the current largest unknown that you've got? Largest unknown. <clears throat> God, there's lots of them. Largest unknown, unknown, I think, would be the the ability to to accelerate at a certain speed without killing people, but going fast. So there's there's traction involved in that, and then there's your steel on steel if you go old school, and then your composite on steel, and there's a lot of stuff in there where if you if you can't get that right, then you just don't really have something that goes fast. Because going fast means you, you averagely go fast. You're speeding up and slowing down all the time because the track's a mess, you know. So yeah, that's probably the hardest problem to solve. Time for one more question. <clears throat> What's your timeline? Um, prototype that looks kind of like that cool render in two years, um, which may or may not be allowed to have people on it, probably not. And then um, five years after that is when we're at mass production and you can take them around. Yeah. Oh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Join hands. And Thank you. I love having my mind blown. I hope you guys too. Um, hopefully that starts lots cool. of interesting um, questions about engineering and, and all sorts of things. But wow, wouldn't it be amazing if this is happening in Canterbury and people were coming to see the trains and ride on the trains here. And it, and it all happened starting with Rollo's vision. So um, thanks so much. Everyone come grab a drink, some food, um, swamp around Rollo and ask him all your tricky engineering questions because he's here for the rest of the evening. Um, and also to the... <laughs> to the team um, from the MSD and Connect also if you've got questions um, about how to um, bring some new people into your team um, they're right here to answer your questions as well thanks everybody <laughs> thank you.